NPT productions like Tennessee Civil War 150 are made possible by the support of viewers like you. Click on the Donate button to make your contribution and get a copy of the show. Thank you. The following program is made possible in part by Tennessee Department of Education, Tennessee Civil War Sesquicentennial Commission, and Tennessee Civil War National Heritage Area. We shall never, any of us, be the same as we have been. This sentiment was shared by women across the South whose lives had been forever changed by civil war. With men leaving for the front line, the entire burden of daily life became theirs to bear. The crucible forced changes in long-held cultural and societal beliefs, breaking boundaries confining most antebellum women while breaking chains for others. Woman naturally shrinks from public gaze and from the struggle and competition of life. In truth, woman, like children, has but one right, and that is the right to protection. A husband, a lord and master, whom she should love, honor, and obey. Nature designed for every woman. The mid-19th century was a white man's world, especially in the antebellum South. North of the Mason-Dixon line, the Industrial Revolution drew increasing numbers of women out of the home and into the factories. But in the agrarian South, there was no such exodus. The early rumblings of the women's suffrage movement could be felt in northern cities as early as the 1840s. However, Southerners took solace in the notion that they had somehow been able to quarantine their homes, churches, and schools from the forces of modernization that was seen as a threat to their traditional way of life. While the wives and daughters of wealthy slaveholding aristocrats enjoyed extravagant lifestyles, they had none of the political rights guaranteed by birth to the poorest white male sharecropper. Subordination of women was enforced through both custom and law. Women were the responsibility of either husband or father. Under the deeply entrenched patriarchal system, Women had no reason to burden themselves with matters of importance to the state. That was the white man's responsibility. Because we are free and because we are men, in a world of slaves and women, we have a world of privilege at stake here and a way of life. And remember that they have already constructed a link between the defense of slavery and the defense of the traditional family. And what they say is, Slavery is like marriage. It is a relation ordained by God specifically to protect the weak. The family is a perfect way to legitimize inequality because almost all men are invested in that form of inequality. Idle Southern women were hard to find, although the meaning of work varied with one's station in society, economic condition, and geographic location. White women were to marry, raise children, and keep an orderly house. Enslaved blacks were property. Denied the most basic human rights, they were considered livestock that could be bought and sold. A woman's place was mainly confined to a limited private sphere, the home and church. Preached from the pulpit and espoused in books and magazines, women were told if they were unhappy or discontented in the sphere to which God had appointed them, it must be their own fault, and by renewed effort, they could do better. As Fort Sumter fell before Southern Cannon in April of 1861, so too would many firmly held beliefs about those confines. President Lincoln's call for Southerners to take arms against their brothers ignited a firestorm of secessionist fever, creating winds of change which would soon upend the sheltered world of women. 
Little thought have I had that I should ever live to see a civil war in this our goodly land, but so it is. There will be many a divided family in this once happy union. There will be father against son and brother against brother. Oh God, that such things should be in a Christian land, that men should in their blindness rush so rashly to ruin and drag with them so many thousands of innocent victims. Of course, my judgment is not much anyway, but in my feeble opinion, they will have cause to repent their rashness. Amanda McDowell's words would prove to be painfully prophetic. She would witness firsthand the divisive effects of the war in Tennessee, with one of her brothers donning Confederate gray, the other Union blue. However, most secessionists were more optimistic about the impending struggle with the North. There was a widely held idea that the Confederacy would overwhelm the Yankees with its military prowess, and in a few months at most, the Union would concede and life would return to normal. I have bid my sons farewell. I do feel I have given my sons not to make war upon an enemy, but to act in self-defense to resist the invasion of a foe to civil liberty. To me, this deadly struggle is a mystery on the part of the North. What do they want? It cannot be to ameliorate the condition of our colored people. When every step they take but enhances the wretchedness of their condition by making them enemies to the best earthly friends they can have. You're dealing with people who are living this very schizophrenic kind of life where they have to constantly convince themselves that these people are happy. And one of my favorite quotes is from a woman who, when her slaves began running away, she said, how could she leave without any kind of provocation? Well, the provocation is slavery itself, right? She didn't tell me she was going. Well, why would she? You're not an employer. It's not a site where white women and black women, you know, become buddies and best friends. Slaveholding women have every right and power that slaveholding men have within that space. The right to order people about, the right to order them separated, sold, killed, whatever. So it's not a kind of sisterhood because you're women. You never knew what it was like to be a slave, to be entirely subject to the will of another. You never exhausted your ingenuity, eluding the power of a hated tyrant. You never shuddered at the sound of his footsteps and trembled within the hearing of his voice. Every one of those rights that we regard as absolutely fundamental, if so fundamental that we take them for granted today, were denied to slaves. Paternalistic masters would allow their slaves to marry, but those marriages were not uh, recognized by law and they could and were often uh, broken up by, by the sale of one of the others. Breaking up of slave families was very common. A large proportion of people who lived their lives or any part of their lives through slavery lost a loved one through sale. I never before wished I was a man. Now I feel so keenly my weakness and dependence. I cannot do or say anything for it would be unbecoming in a young lady. How I should love to fight and even die for my country, but am denied because I am a woman. In many cases, it was a sense of frustration that they were not allowed uh, to do more. And, and of course, many of those who were committed went on to make every contribution they could to the cause. Ladies' aid societies were instrumental in raising money and volunteers. They provided clothing, blankets and food, as well as nursing and comfort to the soldiers. The Society of Southern Mothers most sincerely thank the ladies of Memphis for their promptness in responding to the call made upon them for aid in making up garments for the sick and wounded soldiers. We think that it must be a great source of gratification 
to our brave soldiers in the field to know that while they are battling for all they hold most dear, those whom they love and leave at home are not unmindful of their wants. Those women were not suffering like the, the middle and poor class classes of women. This was particularly true in places like Tennessee, where those in the countryside were suffering far more than women in the Confederate-held territories to the south. The Confederacy uh, is a smaller population than the Union to start with. You know, it's a roughly nine point something million people compared to the Union's 22 million. But even that understates the imbalance or the asymmetry because four million of those Confederates are enslaved and unavailable for military service. So when the, what the Confederacy actually has access to is about six million people, half of them women. And it's really interesting to me that when the war starts, the demands of waging war are such that the small number of men who are voters, these are not enough of the people, and the government has to mobilize and build popular support among a much bigger group of the people of the Confederate States, including those who are disfranchised. And in a way, it's sort of inevitable that women would become consequential in the war in ways that nobody anticipated at the outset. Women often found themselves pushed into the public sphere by the desperate need to provide for their families. More women entered the male-dominated profession of teaching to make ends meet, while others took advantage of the scarcity of manpower to venture into the grueling and dangerous world of factory work. We were yesterday admitted within the Confederate government saber manufactory. We found four large tables ranged from end to end of the room. And at these tables, 250 women and girls were busily engaged in the labor of preparing cartridges. In giving employment, the widows, wives, and families of soldiers have the first preference. The thought of a man having his leg or arm sawed from his body while living was horrifying to our hearts. Yet we had to get used to it, as well as all other distressing scenes attending a state of war. Once they began actively recruiting women to work in Confederate hospitals, women from all social classes were involved. Uh, elite women were involved as hospital matrons. Poor and working class women went to work because they needed the wages and would work as assistants and as nurses. Keep in mind, though, that back in those days, uh, nursing was a basically a male profession, as was school teaching. It took some doing to have women accepted as nurses and school teachers, uh, even when they were badly needed, like during the war. The Civil War was seen by many as a rich man's war and a poor man's fight. Resentment over class privilege grew with the passage of the 20 Negro Law which allowed military exemption of one white male, either owner or overseer, on every plantation of 20 slaves or more. The law also allowed wealthy Southerners to pay a fee to avoid conscription. Between volunteers and conscription, uh, historians think that service levels might have reached 75 to 85 percent of the military age white male population. And the implications for the home front are unbelievable. If the war is, is being partly sold to yeoman men and poor white men, it's not being sold to them as necessary to defend slavery. It's being so sold as necessary to defend your wives and children and your home from invasion. But then they're being removed from home. So they feel already that a contract has been violated. And then this concern about, well, who is this war for? This is not fair. My husband's off fighting for the big man's Negro, and his wife is at home with slaves to make subsistence for her, and I have no one. The overwhelming majority of Confederate troops came from families that could ill afford to lose them. Wives were forced to assume unprecedented responsibility for the South's agrarian economy and slave society. The majority of the white population, yeoman farmers and poor whites, people who own farms, are trying to figure out how to keep body and soul together while these men are gone. Military service age is expanding on both ends. It's getting younger and older. And women are talking about a countryside stripped of men. They're writing collective petitions to governors, begging for them to send home one man. We need somebody to take our crops to mill for us. We need people to take our crops to market. We need to be able to um, have assistance on the farm. Women become the arbiters of exemption. 
who deserves to be exempted? Well, ask the women. So you start seeing these women exercising a certain kind of power, a certain kind of leverage. And the other thing I think that's going on is that politicians begin to recognize these women as constituents in a way they never did before the war. They're developing political skills, they're, they're pooling information, and they're also learning about bureaucracy. For, for poor white and yeoman women, it's a very dire social circumstance, and it creates this necessity of a political response, which they prove themselves capable of. Nobody had ever expected that women would be able to make subsistence on those kinds of farms without sons and husbands and fathers, and they can't. And so with, when this level of mobilization is starting to be reached, even people in the War Department are aware that there's a food crisis, a, a crisis of starvation in the Confederacy. For many struggling homesteads, falling within the path of a foraging army was the fatal blow. This was often the case in Tennessee, which was second only to Virginia in the number of battlefields within its borders. We went into a house not far from camp and found a woman sitting by the fire with a child of about a year old on her hip. She told us that her husband had been in our army for 18 months and that since our army has come here, they've taken nearly everything she had. They've killed her few hogs and taken the little corn she had for herself and family and has left her without any cow and dare not turn her out for fear she would be killed. Now she has nothing left, and it troubles her to know what to do. Once the Union Army invaded and held an area, you know, these areas were vast, and the Union Army, even with all its strength, couldn't be everywhere at once. So they concentrated their troops in these strategic points, the towns. So what you see in the countryside around these occupied towns is, is real chaos, the most violent treatment that you see innocent people undergoing in Tennessee during the war is not at the hands of the Union soldiers, not at the hands of the Confederate soldiers, it's at the hands of the guerrillas and bandits. They murdered Union soldiers, they murdered you know, innocent civilians. These rural areas could be truly chaotic and dangerous places to be. Another reason so many people just gave up and became refugees. Yesterday morning, we saw a train of wagons filled with women and children and a few articles of household goods. These people are native Tennesseans, driven by guerrillas from their farms on account of their loyalty, and are now winding their way to a land where the rebel flag is not tolerated. Elizabeth Avery Merriweather became a refugee after her vocal opposition to the Union occupation of Memphis. Merriweather was seven months pregnant when she and her two small children were banished from town by General William Tecumseh Sherman. I seemed all of a sudden to realize the desolateness of my position, alone in the world, with two children driven from pillar to post, my husband off in the army I knew not where. I became filled with self-pity and cried as if my heart would break. Homeless and stealing food to feed her children, Meriwether's outbursts had cost her dearly. Feeling betrayed by the Confederate government and their men, Southern women began taking matters into their own hands. In 1863, food riots erupt all over the Confederacy. The biggest is in Richmond, and it completely rivets Confederate editorial attention, political attention. In the case of Richmond, we know who organized it. It was a, a woman called Mary Jackson, and a farm wife, and a soldier's mother. And she had tried to get her son out of the army by writing the Secretary of War, and had pleaded with him and had failed. And when she failed, unlike lots of other women, she took an additional step, which was to go to the streets. And she organized 300 women in Richmond for a bread riot. And the thing that's interesting about this is if you don't just look at the women, but if you also read the correspondence of the War Department, and also of all these women who are writing governors, they're basically saying, how much are we supposed to endure? And what does the government owe us? And we soldiers' wives have a legitimate claim on the resources of the government. And people agree with them. Yes, they do. The week before the riot in Salisbury, North Carolina, there's a letter from a group of women who call themselves the regulators, using the term from the American Revolution. And they tell the governor that if he doesn't sort out the law, that they will have bread or blood. 
and we will have it or die in the attempt. In 1860, women do not write petitions to the governor. In 1861, they write only a few. In 1862, they write more. By 1863, it is a deluge of letters going into the governor's office. This food riot looks like it comes out of nowhere, but if you see what's coming into these governor's letters bags in the six or eight months before that, you know that there's a food crisis in the Confederacy and that these women are mobilizing and communicating and there's a whole political culture of women forming in these rural counties. Facing starvation, white Southern women made themselves heard for the first time and forced their government to listen. The Confederate States, and to some extent the Confederate central government, was forced to change policy and build a welfare system that was completely unparalleled in the Union. Georgia spent more money in one year than Massachusetts spent in the whole war. And the relief laws are explicitly written in the image of the soldier's wife, so the instructions go out to counties and say things like, give two pounds of bacon and so much corn per week, distribute first to the soldiers' wives and then to other needy persons. And all of these changes come after the food riots. So the prototype of the welfare recipient in this new system are the women who mobilize to insist that welfare be given. So I think that that's kind of, um, in and of itself, an index of change that the war has brought, and very unexpectedly. Confederate relief laws did ease the food crisis for a while, but the government efforts were woefully inadequate. As the war continued to stretch resources to the breaking point, feeding the army took precedence, leaving the civilian population to fend for themselves. Oh, the sufferings of the poor women and children in this unfortunate country. We have had hundreds of women come into our lines and beg for food their poor, pale, emaciated faces too plainly speaking what they have suffered. No one at home can form the faintest conception of what they have endured and what they still have to endure. While Confederates considered the Union Army as an advancing enemy, slaves saw an opportunity to escape to northern lines. The first people who leave the plantations would be men because they've got this knowledge of uh, the space beyond the plantation. But then increasingly as the war goes on, when these women are given an opportunity, they leave the plantations, they try to get to Union lines. If these women and children were able to elude Confederate patrols on their quest for freedom, there was still no guarantee of sanctuary. There are still a question of, is the Army going to support them? How can we support them? What are they going to do? There's only so many jobs that are available. And commanders kept telling them, go back to where you came from, or if you come in our lines, we're not going to feed you. And so at one point along the Mississippi River, you've got thousands of black women just roaming about because they've got no place to go. As the number of self-emancipated slaves continued to grow, Contraband camps, the Union term for escaped slaves, began to spring up in middle and western Tennessee. If you were lucky, you had maybe a cabin. More than likely, it was a tent camp. It was crowded, it was dirty, it was a great deal of sickness. Most people, by the time they got to the camps, they were not in the best of health to begin with when there are all kinds of shortages. It was not a, a good place. After the Emancipation Proclamation, there is the possibility that you can draft the men out of the contraband camps into the Union Army, but you still have the question of what about the women and the children. The end of the Civil War was a defining moment for African Americans. Basic human rights, so long denied, were now recognized by law and held dearly by those who could now marry and keep their children. When you think of what does freedom mean to black men and black women, one of the first things that many of them do is to enter into some kind of legal marriage. For example, in the contraband camps, they would have these mass marriage ceremonies where you'd have like 20, 30 black couples who would just stand up and they would be married all at the same time. And it was just an indication of the importance of legal marriage within this community. Former slaves were initially concerned with a couple of things. One, finding 
family members who had been sold away and reconstituting their families. And second, figuring out how they would make a living. It's very clear that former slaves were not at all uncertain that they could do it. Do you understand that you have talents and abilities that will enable you to make a life when freedom comes? So there's no question about the optimism and they kept fighting and struggling to get that piece of land and to educate their children and themselves and become citizens of this country, a country that they thought they had earned the right to be citizens of. Hardship and loss presented less favorable changes for white women. The war had left a shattered South in its wake. A quarter of a million men would not be coming home. Thousands more, mentally or physically impaired, were unable to resume the role of protector. Southern women's faith in the patriarchy had been shaken to its foundation. There's no possibility of going backwards after slavery is destroyed. You can't go back, you can only go forward. You can argue over how to go forward and there's a tremendous conflict over how Southern society should be reconstructed after the war. But it has to be reconstructed on a new basis. It's not non-racist, but it's not slavery. Is this the beginnings of a women's rights movement? I don't think it is at all. I call it a politics of subsistence. They're trying to keep body and soul together. And they are acting in, in politically savvy ways and politically successful ways, but they are not talking in terms of rights or women's rights or even citizens' rights. They're talking about soldiers' wives and their claims on the state. They're talking about entitlement in that way. So I think it introduces a really new and unanticipated dynamic between the government and a whole group of women who nobody anticipated becoming of any political significance in the war. And these women are kind of forced into a public role by necessity. So it becomes kind of a movement for social justice in the Confederacy and it's being advanced by people who nobody thought of as capable. And they did it. The war allowed more women to experience the public sphere, to move beyond the confines of home and church. The war, if it taught us anything, should have taught us that everyone, women included, deserved the right to be free and treated equally. Elizabeth Avery Merriweather, the outspoken refugee, returned to Memphis after the war. At a dinner party for friends of her husband in 1867, she confronted the male guests with a question. When will women have the right to vote? You know very well your husband will take care of your interests. Who will take care of the interests of women who have no husbands? Southern women would never allow themselves to be that vulnerable again. Blacks and whites began the long process of redefining their roles in society. This work would fall to later generations, but lessons of the war would not be forgotten. The preceding program is made possible in part by Tennessee Department of Education, Tennessee Civil War Sesquicentennial Commission, and Tennessee Civil War National Heritage Area.